hello and uh, and welcome everyone. It's um, I think this is the third one that I've done, but it's good to see some. I would say new faces, but um, they're not new for faces, familiar faces I just haven't seen for a, a really long time. So welcome along to um, to this session. There's a few of you that have been to a few of the others as well. This session has pivoted slightly from what it was originally. So we've got some. Um, I was going to say old hands on on uh, on this call here, but um, that's not a reflective of age. That's more reflective of experience um, when it comes to when it comes to head refereeing. And in certain people, uh, it's both. Uh, let's be honest. Um, but the the plan really today is to, is to very much do this as a as an an introduction to head refereeing, mm -hmm. rather than a, a masterclass, which is what we were first first doing. So. Uh, for those of you, uh, I'll introduce a few people as we go through because we have got some contributions um, from some of the head referees uh, around uh, England um, in particular. And uh, feel free to, to chip in with, with questions as we, as we go along. This one is less kind of workshoppy because, like I say, there's quite a few bits of uh, video and video footage that we're going to go through from some of our, our head referees. But so feel free to put in the chat any questions. Natalie's going to monitor the chat um, and she can chirp up if there's a question or do take yourself off mute and, and feel free to, to ask a question. Uh, as long as it's on something that is on the screen and is relevant, um, that's all I would ask. But feel free to, to do so. And with that, let's get going. Okay, so introduction to uh, head refereeing. And we're gonna have tonight, we're gonna have contributions from uh, a range of people this evening. Uh, these guys have all submitted um, some videos for us. They're not necessarily all on the call, some are on the call. And it's great to great to have you. Um, so we've got Rachel Toland, who's uh, head referee from the Northeast. Uh, we've got Pam, who's just come back from Australia and is pretty much the boss of refereeing worldwide, I think, is probably her latest title for the BizFed. So it's great to have her back in uh, on these shores. Uh, Steve Ferber, who's um, probably one of the uh, most experienced both in age and in botcher. Um, so it's great to have him actually on the call too. Uh, Liz um, has been great to come through and is one of our newer uh, head referees from just probably about 18 months or so before lockdown. So it'll be, it's really good to have her contributions. Uh, Kaz, who's just got such a wealth of experience from a coaching, from a personal, from a refereeing and a head refereeing perspective. And Dan Headley's contributing too. He's, you know, young, but has been, uh, is incredibly experienced. We um, first kind of came across Dan and, and, um, and brought him into Boccia when he was, I want to say 14, 15 or so and I'm guessing he's a bit older than that now so he's uh, maybe young but he's got many many years experience so what we're going to do is kind of look at some of their video that they have shown us uh, about how they got into being a head referee in particular and then we've asked them for their top tips and they're quite abroad actually so we're at, we were I wasn't sure exactly how this is all going to work until I got all of the uh, the videos in um, but most of them actually, the, a lot of them have got things in common, which is great. Um, but actually a lot of people have found different top tips to talk about. So that'll be really interesting to, to kind of go through. And if you are on the call and you submitted and I'm uh, getting your analysis wrong, then please do chirp up. But to kind of get us started, to get us, get us thinking, I want you to uh, answer this question. Feel free to take yourself off mute once you've had a thought of it. You know, it's one of these playground schoolyard questions. If you could be an animal, what would you be? If you could be any animal in the world, what would you be? So feel free if you maybe have thought about this already, who knows, over the years. If you could be an animal, what would you be? Is there any stick it in the chat or come off mute and uh, and let me know what you would be. I would be a lion. Is that the, because of the mane that you are growing, John? Well, and that, and the fact that I'm a Leo, yes. 
I don't really know what a Leo is, but I'm assuming that's a star sign reference, but I'm, yes. I'm not, I'm afraid I'm not up on star signs. A Leo, okay, very good. I would be an elephant because an elephant never forgets. Um, so I would hope in my everyday life, I would remember so many things. And the 18 month um, pregnancy, is that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm still waiting. <laughs> My bid would be um, a sheepdog, because they're a bit useful than most people like them, so that's good for me. Oh. Okay. There's uh, a few in the chat as well. We've got a cat, tiger, bear, kangaroo, wolf, dog, bird, owl. Interesting. Interesting. Some wise and strong animals. I think that's what we'd all like to be and maybe a combination of, of both, uh, apart from unless you wanted to be a cat. Um, but I suppose cats, they, they have a pretty good life, don't they? So the reason why I'm asking about this really is because the spirit animal of a head referee is absolutely a swan. And this is what we're going to kind of look at. And we all know, you know, that whole, the whole concept of serene on top of the water and paddling like mad underneath the water. And it, I think there's no better animal to sum up a good head referee than a swan. And so that's what we're going to kind of look at a little bit um, this evening is some experiences of some swans that have joined the call, but also, you know, what it takes a little bit but what I'm not wanting to do is to kind of put people off and I'm also not wanting to you know raise head referees above any other position as an official because without head referees you know we wouldn't be able to run competitions without referees you wouldn't be able to run competitions without competition managers we wouldn't be able to run competitions so we, we may be thinking of head referees as almost hierarchical as in you step up from referee to head referee and I would actually suggest it's potentially the other way around you step down into head refereeing because what you will learn through today is so much of the head referee's role is to serve others and is to contribute and to make other people's jobs better and I think that's probably the better way to think about being a head referee. We step down into head refereeing rather than stepping up. It's not a hierarchical thing that we might originally think of. And a good head referee is a swan. So that's the kind of scene setting. So what we think might be a head referee is this situation. Now, some of these slides are taken from um, our uh, head referee training. So you don't need to read the content as such. I'm not gonna go through it in, in too much detail. But I think many people think, and I certainly did, what is a head referee? Well, they're there to answer your questions. Plain and simple. As soon as that hand goes up, you want the head referee to be there. They're there to fix a problem, to answer a question, to solve a mystery, to maybe bring an unruly spectator under control. And that is absolutely one aspect of a head referee, definitely. But I think what's really clear from the videos that have come in is actually that is probably the most visible element, but it's probably the least significant element of a head refereeing, or certainly from a time point of view. The amount of time that a head referee takes in problem solving is actually pretty small as a proportion in comparison to pretty much every other element of the, of the job that they do. And whether that's a local, you know, you are a local competition, whether that's national, whether that's international. And what you'll probably find as well is interestingly is the more experience you get or the higher up the competitions that you get, actually the least this is called upon. It's more the local competitions. It's the you know, new players coming in that maybe don't know the rules. It's maybe the level one referees on their first outing. That's actually probably where you have more of this. And as you kind of go up the chain, as you end up in um, B Cup competitions and potentially even in internationals, we are blessed to have some international referees in our midst in, in England and Scotland, uh, probably outside of Spain and Portugal, disproportionate, really, in comparison to the rest of the world. 
But once we get to that stage, actually this element of being a head referee is reduced. So maybe the thing that we think about isn't the most significant thing. And really, one of the things or the thing which we spend most of the time on are actually all of these things. And this is really what I mean about stepping down into head refereeing because you're there to, to serve rather than to uh, be the boss, I suppose. Because you've got all of these different roles and responsibilities that you have to do from pre-competition scheduling all the way through to feedback log books and all of the rest of stuff that you that you have to do. So some of the things that you might have, some of the roles and responsibilities would be scheduling, briefing, support, call room. You know, there's uh, elements of um, how that might change from regional to, to national. There's potentially the difference between a head referee and assistant head referee. By the way, assistant head referee is the best job. If you can get if you can get that ticket as an assistant head referee, you will have a great weekend and a great competition. You've got other elements in there on code of conduct and social media, potentially from other view, other referees that you have on court. It could be from other teams and players. So some of those are more traditional stuff that you might think about being important as a, as a head referee. But actually, it starts way before that. It's liaising with Rachel. It's liaising with Natalie. It's liaising with the Scottish office and the Welsh office and wherever it might be, to find out who's entered the competition, which players are around, how many referees have you actually got? What's the timeline? Do you have to finish early? Do you have to take a lunch break? Because all of this scheduling can take an, a, massive, a massive amount of time to prepare. Now, over the years, we've got better at this, I would say. Um, thinking back to when I started head refereeing, well, not even started head refereeing, you know, when we were still uh, CP Sport in those beginning days of, of Butcher England, it was very much paper driven and we would print off and stick things on walls. And, you know, if you've come to Butcher in the last five years, you may be uh, familiar with TV screens and website updates and, and those kind of things. But that really is relatively recent. And a lot of the people that we have on the call today would recognise that. And even if you aren't a head referee, but you've been involved in Butcher for a while, you'd recognise the amount of paper that we have cut down from over the last few years is actually is phenomenal. And I'm sure that we really have genuinely saved a rainforest. Um, but scheduling and the pre-competition stuff is, is really important. There's other things that are in there that you might not think about too specifically, like level two mentoring. We have a mentoring scheme for referees. How does that fit in? What's the rotation? And when I'm talking scheduling, I'm not talking about matches. I'm talking about referees and the rotation of the referees. How can you make sure that they get the right breaks, a range of matches, um, that they're not stuck on the same court or they're only refereeing the same pool of players as well? So there's lots of different combinations and things that you have to take into account of. Obviously, once you get there, you have things like officials briefing, how to the introductions, talking about the context of the competition. And then there's a little bit there, and we'll talk about it a bit more um, around volunteer management, trying to get the concept across around how much you, know, you need to go and uh, make sure that you've got your parking ticket sorted, all the way down to lunches and all of those other elements. We do have templates and we do have things that, we, that we've developed over the last few years, but again, to be honest, that's relatively recent stuff. But a lot of the things that we actually end up doing is actually around volunteer management. From bringing the referees into play um, and uh, training through mentor schemes and things like that, which Watcher England will, will lead on. But you as the head referee need to be aware of the other roles that are around you. Assistant head referees, the referee levels that, they, that you have in place. Are you fortunate to have the gold standard liner and timer? Because that can make such a massive difference. Maybe you're doing some officials developing or you've got people who are refereeing and officials developing. Potentially you've got officials developers, referees and classifiers, and they're all the same person. And we all know from, from Vocha how much of the roles that we have are, are multiple, often on the same weekend and even on the same day. So maybe classification doesn't finish till a certain time. And then after that time, maybe they're freed up to be a referee. All of these different factors come in, as well as the welfare. 
because we ask referees to be on their feet from 9.30 through till 6 p.m. You know, eight and a half hours, nine hours of pretty much relentless refereeing. And we have to be able to make sure that we can um, schedule in breaks, refreshments, because lunch window might be at a certain period if it's being delivered, all the way through to um, individuals who may have particular needs that you need to be aware of. Could be that they are reliant on taxis and collections. There's all sorts of different elements that are in there that you need to be aware of. Now, these slides are taken, again, from the head referee training. So we're literally skimming over these super quick just to kind of give you an idea. And then to finish the weekend off, it's then giving feedback to the referees. This is where particularly assistant head referees are incredibly important. But this is something we've really <clears throat> developed over the last few years. If you've been refereeing for a little while um, or you've had experience in, in the past in other competitions, most referee logbooks historically has been uh, in the name of the competition, the number of games as a referee or a liner. Uh, and then in the comments box, you know, it says something like good job, smiley face. And that's what we, you know, have done historically, We've, we actually haven't given feedback. And over the last few years, probably the last three years, I guess, excluding this last year, so maybe the last four years, we've really started to be <clears throat> a bit more constructive in our, in our feedback to, to help people develop. Some of that's not necessarily well received. It's, it's hard to, to kind of manage that, but it is something that we are trying. We do always try to put a positive in there, but that can be quite a difficult balancing act um for you as a as a head referee so we talk about a star and a wish so if you've never noticed that formula if you look at your more recent uh log books from um Butch England events certainly ones that um, i've been head refereeing and i'm sure this is the case for others you probably see something like a star and a wish something that they've done particularly well and maybe something that they could uh develop or they could change hopefully delivered in the in a nicest possible way these are all of the things that we are doing as a, as a head referee and then you need to manage conflicts then you need to manage protests then you need to manage those difficult questions and then you get it all done and then what does natalie want she wants a competition report a post competition report on top of that so we do have a template for that by the way as we've done with lots of these things so really, we're coming onto the videos now, but it's just to reflect back. If you think a head referee is a cushy job and they sit there in that seat and they look like they're having a great time watching a ton of botcher, well, they are a very good head referee because they are absolutely a swan because they are paddling away, churning all of this stuff off um, underneath the surface of the water. Meanwhile, looking serene and beautiful and there to support and to, to give you the guidance that you need. So if you look at them and you think that's the case, know that they are good at what they do. And that's how you want to be or how you should be as a, as a head referee. So what we're going to do now is, is just start running through the videos. I think we've got six people delivering um, some of their ideas. They're varying in length uh, some of them are short some of them are long that i had to edit to shorten so apologies if that's you and you feel like i cut out the vital thing um some of them some people send a couple of videos in some of them didn't all, all as one but what we're going to do is just watch their video and i picked out three or four points from each of the video that we can then talk about and feel free to ask any questions about and again if you are that person if you are that head referee that sent in the video feel free to comment. And the idea is over this next hour or so, is just to go through them to uh, start uh, seeing from a head referee's perspective, the stuff that brought them into head refereeing and some of their top tips. And then we'll kind of round out to, um, at the end um, of today's session as to uh, you know, what we can do next and where we can go from here. So before I move on, a few minutes now just to feel free to stick in the chat or to come off mute are, are the things that we have on on the screen what you expected as a head referee is it different um 
uh, is anyone daunted by the amount of stuff that, that would be asked of you? So just any questions or, or any comments on, on that uh, little piece of introduction, feel free to put it in the chat or to come off mute. And again, if anyone is a head referee um, and, they, and they wanna kind of speak to the stuff that we've just, that I've just mentioned, then that would be really great to hear from you before we move on. My comment would be how nice it is for all this to be aired for these people who are aspiring head referees. Um, I, for one, and I'm sure no, I'm not alone, discovered all this stuff after you accepted the invitation. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it did look a little bit easy, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the amount of hours I spent with a paper and pad writing out schedules just to, was unbelievable. But uh, um, the, the thing that has made the job so much easier, as Richard said, is this um, electronic scheduling program that we now have. That's a, been an absolute godsend. Mm. And I think I, I, I agree with Steve on that one. Um, years ago, we had a lot of paperwork and now it's wonderful. It's so much easier to then concentrate on, you know, the team that you have around you. Um, and it's very easy to see the schedules. It's very easy to, to plan ahead, uh, do your pre-competition, but it, it's so much easier. This is wonderful. This is wonderful stuff. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so what we're going to do now, I think we are, we are starting with young Steve. Um, so Steve put in, in a video, I think it's about 90 seconds long, introducing um, himself and uh, how he got into the sport and then a few top tips um, and then we can have a chat. So uh, hopefully this will be loud enough and we'll come through. Um, if not, let me know and we can uh, play it again and let you put your headphones in or something like that. Okay, here we go. Hi, I'm Steve, and if we haven't already met, I hope it's not long before we do. My route into becoming a referee in the first place, and later as a head referee, are based quite simply on the premise of I'm not very good at saying no to an invitation. It's nice to get invitations, of course. Um, presumably someone has seen within you um, some potential or even proven ability that you can do a job for them. In my case, I feel perhaps it was less admiration than desperation, but I accepted the invitation and here I am. There are many aspects to being a head referee, which I'm sure this course will cover. I just want to add that if you feel a little bit daunted by some of the responsibilities, don't be put off. There's, we, we work with lovely people and there's always lots of good support around. And don't forget that within the world of Boccia, we do work with the nicest people on the planet. I've been asked for my top tip. I've got two. The first, like many other people, I'm saying, will learn the rules. Um, end of end of the matter. Second tip: don't drink too much and go to the toilet whenever you get the chance. <laughs> the end. <laughs> right. Well, I think staying hydrated with water is is a key thing, Steve. I'm I assume that is what you're referring to when you said don't drink too much. Not but too much. Um, <laughs> thank you thank you steve so some of these things will be repeated uh, like point one will be repeated across many people's videos so i won't keep going over the same point but i think it's worth saying that historically that is certainly how we've we uh, have done um head refereeing it's been <laughs> by invitation only um and you know it, it's it's definitely felt hard because we've it's such an important role but also it does carry a lot of responsibility and historically not much training and a lot of paperwork and just like Steve talked about there there's just a lot to get your head around and, and hopefully you know with the work that um, Rachel and Natalie have done over the last few years to really streamline that stuff to make life a whole lot easier um, you know it is a little bit less daunting but historically invited to become a head referee. I guess one of the things that we wanted to get out of this call for you guys that are new head referees or people who are maybe thinking about it is that we want, we don't want to be in a situation where we're inviting. We, uh, it's great to have so many new faces on here. Um, there must be at least 10 of you who I haven't seen head referees, I'm assuming aren't head referees, but are potentially interested in that area. Um, and so it's really 
great to see that we do have an interest and we would love to be in a situation where we we put out an advert and people could say and put their hands up rather than having their hands tied behind the back, which is maybe what it's seen. And you'll hear repeated again across a, a number of people said in jest and um, but it isn't necessarily the first things uh, that people jump to. Uh, the second point I, I really want to draw out is that don't feel daunted. All of the previous slides that I've just shown you uh, are absolutely true, but don't feel daunted by it. Like that is all of the stuff. It's a little bit of a reality check, but it's not, it's not that you're left alone to do it. And Steve's point about the support that you get from others and from um, Watcher England really does help get kind of get you established and now with some of the bigger competitions having assistant head referees and they can kind of get a flavor of, of what it might be some of the roles and responsibilities that you have but without having um you know the big job on on your shoulders historically we only had that really at national championships once a year um and it was quite a hard thing to to kind of um yeah to get experience of so if you looked at those previous slides just thought oh you know, what I wanted to do was to go on court and to help people. I wanted to problem solve and look at all of this other stuff that I have to do. I think Steve's message of don't feel daunted is, is one that I really want to reiterate. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I've put Steve's video first was is because of that. Thirdly, um, know the rules. Now, you do not have to be an expert. You do not need to know uh, the reference of what 12.2b is or whatever it might be, but you do need to know them. You can fall back on them. You will can carry around your, your rules with you to help on court, but you do need to know them. Maybe not inside out, but to the fullest extent that you possibly can. It's recognising that as well that, of course, we may be having new referees on here when we come back from from COVID, we may not see competitions in the same size as they were, certainly in the start. So we may actually need more head referees because the competitions may, might be more local and like might be a little bit smaller. So we don't need to be a national level, uh, level three referee and know everything and have passed the test to be a head referee. We might call on you or ask for you to, to raise your hand even, even if you're not a, a level three but know the rules and go to the toilet. Yeah, I thought this was good. The reason by the reason being is, is especially as a head referee, again, it looks serene when you're sat at the desk, but actually when you're there, it feels like a prison. <laughs> you, are, you are tied to that chair it can feel like because it's very difficult to, to get away because obviously in order to move away from there to go to the bathroom, you need your assistant head referee to, to kind of cover the courts for you. Well, they're only there for half the time because the other half of the time they're doing call room. And of course, when they're there, you're also then doing things like uh, checking the score sheets as they come in, liaising with the competition management to make sure that the next, you know, that all of the scores are up to date and that the, you know, you're doing some volunteer management, making sure that the welfare of uh, referees as they come off court and they've just done a back to back to back set of matches. So actually, when you do get those moments, it is absolutely critical that you take them. Steve, have I missed anything? Is there anything you want to add to that? Or are there any questions for Steve from, uh, from the group around some of the things that he raised? No, we'll ship with what we've got then. Good. Okay. So that's Steve. Let's move on to Liz, one of our newest head referees. Hi, my name's Liz. Um, so, first question, why did I become a head referee? I've been refereeing at national level for many years and I like being busy and I love to juggle. Uh, my top tip um, for being a head referee is appoint someone friendly to be your team monitor because you won't have time to fetch one. It's pretty busy. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. Yeah, again, similar similar theme, isn't there, about toilet breaks or, or tea breaks or lunch breaks as a head referee. It's um, They've come pretty rare. I think that one of the things that Liz 
picked out there was around um, multitasking and how that skill is is absolutely essential and you you can sit there and it can absolutely fly by the time that you have because there's just another job and another job and another job and then maybe there's an issue on courts so there's just so many different things that you have to go through multitasking is essential it can also be difficult to do because multitasking can be hard to process. Uh, I'm very much a single task person. So I'm much better at focusing on, on one task at a time. And I get through a list of tasks a whole lot better uh, when, it's, when I do it like that. But as a head referee, you don't necessarily have that luxury of how to plan out your work day or however you might uh, during the week. When you're at a budget competition, you could be right in the middle of something, but if someone's hand does go up on court, or there is a problem with a referee or they're not feeling well and you have to reschedule, you have to be able to you know, manage multiple situations um, in order to, in order to uh, get the most out of the day, in order to keep everything on time, running on time. That's something that we'll cover definitely a little bit later. So multitasking is absolutely essential. And that doesn't mean that it has to come naturally to you. It doesn't come naturally to me. But it's something that, that you do need to be able to, to do um, in order to, to be that swan, I would say. Liz, is there anything you want to, to mention? No, I mean, I agree with what Steve has said, and I'm sure I'm going to agree with what everybody else has said. <laughs> it's, it's busy, you know, it's enjoy. I like being busy, so it's enjoyable. But you know, you've just got to have eyes everywhere. Yeah, yeah, and it is hard, especially when you're looking down at the score sheet, but someone's hand is on court. And, it, you know, I know I've been there as a referee. There is nothing more frustrating as a referee when your hand is up and you look across and the head referee's got their head in a laptop. And you're thinking, come on, you should be looking at the court. You should be helping me. But it is because there is just so many things to do. So, yes, eyes are incredibly important and only become more important uh, as you go. Liz, I was just wondering, because you've got experience uh, from, you know, uh, a coach as well as refereeing into uh, this head refereeing probably more recently. So you did the, the head referee uh, workshop that we did a few years ago Um just what, what were some of the differences that you found, particularly in that difference between uh, refereeing to head refereeing? And did, did when you become a head referee change your perspective as a referee? The answer could be no, of course, and that's absolutely fine. But I'm just interested to, to hear from, as our, one of our newest ones, how, how that transition was for you. Um, I guess I hadn't realised until we did the training, just how much was actually involved in as much as um, with the making certain that there's always the right people in the right place at the right time. Um, so, um, and making certain that people's welfare is being looked after. So I guess I was aware of it, but not aware of just how much of the job was involved with that, I guess, from an outsider perspective, probably you think it's more about knowing the rules, but it's not. Yeah, of course, people, of course that is important. Yeah, Pe people management ends up, you know, from a time perspective, is probably, you know, one of the biggest chunks of your time, uh, whether that's from scheduling to uh, dealing with people um, on a one-to-one on -one -one basis as you kind of go through the day. <laughs> one of the nice things about the head referee is that, um, at the moment, we we use a, a have used a, a paper format internationally. We have moved away from that slightly to an international uh, to a uh, an online system. And one of the differences I found between national competitions, well, dreaming competitions, and international competitions, is that we do still have a relationship between rounds with referees. And so referees do come to you, and it's good just to be able to have that little chat to them, that little catch up just to look into their eyes and to see how tired that they are can really give you an idea about where they're going and potentially any scheduling changes you might have. Internationally, that's kind of, we've lost that a little bit. So certainly when I'm a head referee, I, I ask people to come to the desk just to check in with me. Maybe not every round, but every other round. I do like to see 
uh, every referee in the session. So if it's a morning session, afternoon session, evening session, I do like to, to check that. And I do personally, one of the things I do is I have a list of all of the referees and I literally tick them off if I've seen them or not. Um, it could be a number of reasons why you don't see them. It could be a language barrier and so communication is, is difficult. Um, but also you, there could be many different, different reasons. That's one of the things that I found really useful uh, as an international head referee uh, and not needed as much as a as a head referee um, for for Botcher England. Okay, thank you, Liz. Let's move on. Pam, here we go. So, oh, why did I take the step up from being a referee to head referee? I think at the time there was no one willing or able to commit the time to do it, so it was offered to me. No one, no one willing to step up. We've heard that one before, haven't we, Steve? Here we go, a second one. Tip for head refereeing is stay calm. Even if you don't feel calm, give the impression that you are calm. Because you'd be amazed at the things that can crop up that you didn't plan for, and the responsibilities can easily overwhelm you. If you stay calm, you'd be amazed at how you can there you go. Thank you, Pam. Yeah, stay calm, even if you don't feel it. Now, that, that is a skill and something which takes practice. Um, absolutely uh, takes practice. It isn't something that comes naturally, uh, I would assume, to, to pretty much anyone. To stay calm, even if you don't feel it. To kind of give that aura of confidence. Meanwhile, you're, you know, again, going back to the swan metaphor, paddling away through the rule book in your brain or through a suddenly a scheduling change because someone had, has fallen ill or there's a, a conflict in, in some way um, between you know, a mistake that you've maybe made in the scheduling. And so you've got someone from the same country or the same club or a family member, refereeing a family member. And these things are so easily, so easily done. So sometimes that staying calm bit can be really difficult. Um, I just wonder, Pam, I'll, I'll just touch on the second point, but I wonder if you could just, if I come back to you and if you could share with us a story as to where you've had to implement number one, where you've had to stay calm even when you don't, uh, you don't feel it. So I'll come back to you in a second, Pam. And the second bit was around kind of the expecting the, the unexpected. Like you might go onto court thinking you know what it is, oh, it's going to be a measure here. But that measure might develop into something else because maybe the referee moved the ball when they shouldn't have. Again, could be we're talking about loads of different levels of refereeing. We're not talking necessarily. Actually, we're not talking about international referees. We really are talking about local and regional and national level competitions and referees. And so you could go in and think it's one thing. And actually, you need to know that it could be anything. And I think Dan has a, um, he's one of the last videos, he's got a really great example of uh, expecting the unexpected. Uh, he's got a great story that he shares a little bit later on. So Pam, have you got an example to hand as to, uh, you know, where you've had to stay calm even if you've not felt it? Um, yes, one is the nationals in Australia. Um, there was a just from the beginning, it was very, not very well organised. The, the technical delegate was only given the, the role a few weeks before and didn't really have much experience in it. Uh, we had no volunteers to do timers. We had to just come up to do the, you know, to, to, to time. Um, we got that sorted out and then referees were falling ill. I think, you know, one of two referees fall ill or couldn't referee for various reasons, a family member fell ill. So I had to just look at people who weren't national referees, but maybe had some sort of referees, so just to ask them to, to come, you know, would they be able to do a round or so. Um, find out, make sure that they were put on a match that wouldn't, you know, be above them and things like that. It was just one of those events where just things just kept coming up that you weren't expecting. And yeah, I learned a lot from that one. Um, it, but it, yeah, it just made me realise that you know things just come on top of you. Just take a deep breath, think about it, and yeah, get on with it. And as you say, paddling away underneath, you know, you're in a turmoil. How do I do this? How do I do that? 
but you smile and you don't shout, you don't scream. You, yeah, you cope. Yeah. Try not to shout, try not to scream. Don't shout, don't scream, absolutely. Yeah, and again, that's a really good example, Pam. The reason it's, I think that's such a good example, a powerful example, is because it's it's not about, an, that wasn't about an on-court decision. That was about many little things, again, thinking of that much wider scope of a head referee and all of those layers starting to build up. Um, you know, think of them as brick layers. Each one is manageable on their own but you still have to burden those many layers of bricks on your shoulders as, as the head referee. And, you know, without being too dramatic, you know, the show must go on. You know, we, we've got a competition to get to. People have traveled, people in Australia, I see you have flown in order to be there, have taken time um, and, you know, a huge expense in order to be there. And ultimately you need to be finished by 6 p.m. on Sunday evening or whatever it might be in order to, to get it, to get it done and you are uh that that buffer as it were you are the person the problem solver in order to to get that to get that done now uh, pam mentioned uh technical delegates there if you don't know what that is technical delegate is is one of the roles that you have at, at bigger competitions and they pretty much sit between the the refereeing team and the classifying team and kind of unites them they also uh, link in with the local competition organizers as well so they're kind of like the, the pivot point for all of these key key elements now technical delegates are incredibly experienced and, and wise but they're not an expert in competition management they're not an expert in classifying and they're not an expert in refereeing they are a, a jack of all trade but i wouldn't say master of none but because they're all very good and very competent and that's certainly what we're trying trying to to get to um, so you do have someone that you can turn to a shoulder for you to 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 go and speak to you maybe you've had some experience but ultimately for you as a head referee you know the rules you are in charge of charge of the rules and just while i'm thinking about this i think we've got sandra king on the call who's a, is an international technical delegate and i think by her own confession on a call that we were on earlier in, in the week or, or last week, you know, is not a head referee, um, but is, is uh, I wonder if, Sandra, if you're there, if you've got a, a, yes. something that you could share about, as a technical delegate, how you still, you, you lean on the head referee and the head referee leans on you, maybe. Yeah, actually the, the uh, technical delegate and the head referee of an international competition are usually appointed at roughly the same time. And for me as technical delegate, there's, there's, I have two really key people that I work with. One is the competition organiser, and for anything on court, it's the head referee. So I always want to make sure I've got a really good relationship with that head referee. Um, ahead of the time, I want to know that they are happy in the rules. And um, actually, as somebody that's appointed by BISFED, I kind of fill that gap between. And if this Ultimately, the buck stops with the TD if something happens at a competition and there's no rule that tells you what to do with it. Um, but if it's an on-court thing that happens, it's the head referee that's going to give me the best advice possible. And most of the time I'll be supporting what the head referee says uh, because that they have the best knowledge of the rules and more importantly, the rules as they're being interpreted at that time uh, by international referees in general. So I, the relationship between the TD, um, the, org, the host organising committee and the, the head referee is just absolutely crucial. Um, and uh, I'm glad to say that I've always had fantastic head referees and it's been great to work with them. Thanks, Sandra. Yeah, it's worth pointing out that uh, TDs are a, a rarity. They are um, they are probably worth more than Bitcoin right now because we don't get to have them on many competitions. They, they do tend to be the grander competitions, the ones which are larger that have got, uh, you know, maybe outside competition um, organizers. Um, so that is less likely to see that domestically. And, and if you're on here thinking, I've got no idea what a technical delegate, this is all way above, above my head. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it because it's not something that you'll really see till, till later on, but just, Pam mentioned it, and so and I had Sandra on the call, so I thought I would uh, I would use them in order to, to just talk about that for for a brief 
a brief second. So thank you, Sandra, for that. No, thanks. And actually, that's probably the biggest reason for me personally to be on the call is because as a technical delegate, I really need and want to understand everything that a head referee is going through. Um, because yes, I'm, I'm one of those people that I'm a level two referee at the moment. So the likelihood of me being a head referee, I do enough other things. I probably don't want to do that as well. Um, yes. But understanding the head referee, I think is crucial. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Pam, for that. And let's move on. Who have we got next? Richard, is it possible yeah. to turn the volume up on the videos? Uh, I, I think in that case, I think uh, Pam's video was probably just, I think it was her recording was a little bit quiet, but let me let me see what I can do. We'll try this uh, now with, with Kaz's. Now, Kaz's starts quiet and gets louder, you know. Uh, there's so so many uh, so many things I could say right there, but we'll just say that. So don't worry, it will get a little bit louder. Good evening, everybody. Um, my response to the question uh, why I went from being a, a referee to a head referee um, is not an easy one because I think there was a shortage of head referees at the time, um, and I was asked to step into that position because I've been refereeing for quite a few years. Um, and it was a challenge, um, one I was happy to accept. And I think the first one where um, I had to do a, a, a PowerPoint presentation and organize schedules and everything was quite a challenge, um, as I said, but um, you do it. Um, and after the first uh, competition, um, I felt quite confident to continue in that role. And um, I love being head referee, um, I don't know, on the international circuit, but certainly on the national circuit, more than happy to be a head referee. And there's such a, a lovely team of officials out there that, you know, everyone's so supportive of each other. Um, go for it. If you want to be a head referee, go for it. it it's it's one that, you know, I, I accepted quite happily and I don't have any regrets about it at all. So go there. OK, take care. Bye for now. So encouraging, Kaz. Hey, positivity is excellent. And um, we're going to jump straight to your top tips, then we'll have a chat. Coachable, being confident, enthusiastic, and being sure of the decisions you make. Um, I think that, that that's important, especially if you're, you're called on to court. Um, don't look at it always from the player's perspective. Um, listen to the referee. If the referee is telling you about a situation that has occurred, then um, do that with calmness, without being pressured, um, and be supportive, very, very supportive. That's the most important thing. Um, and don't be an authoritarian, just to be yourself. And that's the most important thing, being approachable. Um, and making sure that you run the schedule to time, that's always vitally important. And working with the call room, getting matches onto court as soon as you can. Um, and hopefully the, the competition will run smoothly um, without any um, uh, protests from anybody. You don't want any protests if you don't have to have it. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's just being approachable. Um, uh, that's the most important thing and encouraging, okay? Okay, take care. Bye for now, bye. I feel like I was on a telephone call. I assume that's how you sign off with all of your phone calls uh, at the end, Kaz. But yeah, thank you for that. Some, some really good points. And, and I think the first one, you know, it is a challenge. It's probably one that's been alluded to a little bit. You know, um, at least talked about multitasking. Um, Steve talked about it being daunting. Uh, Pam talked about sometimes the relationships and you go into an environment, it's not necessarily as set up as you or you're not necessarily working with people that are as experienced as you maybe would want them to be. I think all of that speaks to is the different types of challenges that are there. And I guess what would have been easy um, for all of the people on, on this call would be to face those challenges and then to say, it's, it's not for me. Uh, and I'm just trying to think, I, I genuinely can't think of, uh, I can think of one. I can think of one person that's maybe done head refereeing for the once and just gone, Hey, look, this is just not in my skill set. This is, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a really great referee, but actually head refereeing isn't for me. 
it's not been easy for any of us. It is a challenge, but I think what, what Kaz spoke to so well was how to kind of overcome that or, or what you can get out of it as you, as you start to grow in your experience. I think when she uh, talks about national support, it is really worth saying that um, you are, and I have mentioned it several, several times, uh, is the, the tools that are, are in place um, as from, from Butcher England over these last few years. When uh, Steve and I and, and Pam and uh, possibly even Kaz, I can't quite remember on, on the timelines, you became head referees, it, there, there really wasn't anything in place. In fact, there really wasn't even a, a level one or even a regional referees course. It, it really was, oh, hello, he, here's a paddle. Get on, get on court. And you know, how I started refereeing was uh, my dad basically said, do you want, do you want a day off school? And I says, yeah, he says, oh, don't worry, um, that, you know, it'll be fine. The one problem is it's in Sunderland. And I was like, oh, I'm not sure about going south of the Tyne. But we did. And we got back north of the Tyne pretty quick. That was back in the days when it was at Nissan, if for those of you who remember that far back. But it was a case of who you know and kind of being roped in. And that is, uh, you know, part of the, I guess, I want to say professionalization of the sport over the last few years, that that has changed. And that there is that national support that's there. But I think one of the other big things is the support that not that you just give to the referees, but that you also receive. Uh, and there are so many times that, especially other head referees who are then refereeing, you know, look at you behind the desk. They know what it's like. And they come to you and say, do you want a cup of tea? And I say, Earl Grey. And they roll their eyes uh, and then say, you want extra milk too. But that is how I like my tea, just for reference, in case anyone had forgotten over the last year. Um, but you do get those people and they really recognise uh, that in a, in a head referee. And so referees can be a real support to head referees as well. And you definitely know the ones that you can lean on in, in a quandary in a bit of an issue. So maybe you've got some issues that Pam was talking about. Maybe, you know, a referee falls ill and, you know, you can't rope anyone else in. Who do you turn to in a back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back situation? And you have to be mindful. You can't just keep going to the same, the same person each time because obviously you need to look after their welfare and fatigue levels, especially over a multi-day event. You really do need to consider that. But you do get to learn and know the referees and know the ones that you can turn to. You know the ones that you don't need to, um, you know, look for. They're there right in front of you, ready and eager, eager to help. And, you know, that is just such an encouragement to, to know that's there. So if you are a referee and on this call and you're going into your competitions and, you know, you're thinking this head referee looks good, but maybe in the future, maybe in a year, that is something that you can support head referees on is just your availability, your enthusiasm, your eagerness um, in order to support the, the head referee to get the job done, to get the competition uh, done to a high standard. So, you know, I, I think I've definitely felt the referee's support as being a big thing over the years. Yeah, maybe they can't help with the scheduling in a admin point of view, but they certainly can in a very practical point of view. Um, and so, you know, that's something that shouldn't be shouldn't be overlooked. Uh, Kaz's point around approachable. Yes, it's interesting as approachable because there's many forms because there's many to many people. And I think um, a couple of other people talk about the different responsibilities to different referees, uh, to referees or to players. Approachability uh, is important, um, but it's potentially different. The way that you maybe interact in the call room and in the, the briefing before you go onto, onto court with your referees is maybe a little bit different to how you would interact with players if there's an issue on court. And so it doesn't mean that you should be standoffish, but your tone changes for the setting as it does in, in, every, other, in every environment uh, throughout life really. But it's just remembering about being open and, and approachable both as a referee or as a player, or as an angry coach who just has got something to get off their chest and you know what they probably shouldn't be talking to you but you know what this is a northeast competition or a southwest competition and you're the person that they're going to look to and turn to and come to and you know what i would rather that they took that out on me than they did on a referee on, on the next round so that approachability does change based on who you're talking to but ultimately should be universal across the competition 
be sure of the decisions you make. Hopefully that makes sense as a combination, I would say, of the confidence that uh, Pam talked about and the know you rules that Steve talked about. And if you have those two things, then you will make good decisions. Uh, what else have we got? Support the referee. Yeah, when you go onto a court and the hand is raised, the temptation, especially as an inexperienced head referee, is to go to the player which is shouting the loudest, that is upset the most, that is crying. But actually the person that you should be speaking to first is the referee, because that's who you are there to support, because the referee is there to support the players. So if you go bypass the referee and end up going straight to the, the loudest or the the most weeping player, first of all, you're potentially undermining the referee, but also you might not get the right decision. You're, the way that you approach the decision that is about, you know, the question that's about to be asked and the decision you're about to make may well be affected by the, by the emotion of a player who may rightly be you know, upset about the situation. But we're there to support the referee because the referee is there to support the players. If that can't be done, you know, if, if that is an irre irreconcilable situation, then that's where you do get more involved. But I think as an intro to refereeing, that's probably not something we're going to talk about too much tonight. The big thing, point six, and if you are making notes, which I don't think anyone is, but if you are, this would be the thing that I would say as a head referee takes up the majority of my thinking or my, my brain space is keeping to time. Because a little bit like Pam was saying about these different layers that can build up, if you just get behind time a little bit for no reason, as in you're just a little bit late out of the call room, well, that means that those matches are going to finish a little bit later. So the, the difference between all of the matches finishing and the next call room is really short. And then it, you've got a back-to-back -back referee and they need to go to the toilet. So suddenly the next round is on late and over a period of six hours, you can e easily go quite far behind. And as soon as you get to half an hour, 20 minutes, half an hour, and you're getting towards semi you know, knockout stages, what it might actually mean is that players aren't available to go to the call room because they've just come off court and they then need to get to call room or that they need to do personal care or whatever it might be. Suddenly then you have to delay, you know, have a competition delay, which basically puts a halt to everything for a certain amount of period uh, to get everyone can, up to speed. And then the competition is absolutely officially running late. So this is the thing that haunts me the most is keeping to time. And that's where the call room is so important. And again, if you don't know what the call room is, it happens at bigger competitions. It's essentially where all of the players congregate and meet their referee, do things like the coin toss introductions, you know, the check botcher balls and, and all of that kind of stuff before you parade out. Now, the assistant head referee runs the call room. And that's why I think they have the best job because they get their up and about, they're moving around they're, and their day absolutely flies. So if you ever get asked, oh, do you want to be an assistant head referee? Do it because it's great. It's, it's the best job that you can that you can have, I would say, in in uh, officiating. But make sure that they are as head referee, make sure that your assistant head referee is drilled. There's no other way to put it. You, they need to be absolutely drilled. And if they're running a little bit low, you really do need to keep on keep on top of them because it will just make your life so much easier. You want referees to rest between matches. You don't want them resting whilst they're in the call room because you're running late. So keep to time and keep the you know the call room timing is absolutely absolutely vital. Kaz, is there anything there that you, you want to raise up or, or speak about? Um, I'd love you to speak on the last two points anymore. There's been a situation where you've maybe, it could be international, that where you've ended up being delayed and you've been in the call room for a, an extended period of time. I can think of one down in Seville, I think it was, um, a few years ago, where we seemed to be stuck in absolutely stifling heat uh, in because the, they had like a garage facility. Um, was it, no, sorry, I'm thinking of Barcelona, just outside Barcelona, where you end up, you're in the call room, it's like in a garage facility, and it was just absolutely boiling, and we were stuck there for half an hour longer than we should. Uh, have you got anything that you could share? Um, not really. My only think, uh, thinking is, you know, if you've got to have medical timeouts, and if you've got to have technical timeouts, that has a knock-on effect, totally knock-on effect of matches. Um, uh, when it goes to tie break, 
and you've got five matches that go to tie break and you're trying to get the pool do uh, pools done, um, it, it's, it's a juggling, I think, as Liz said, it's about juggling it and trying to get back on track and snatching five minutes here and five minutes there. Um, as long as you've got a good call room manager as well, I think that's where the call room manager and the assistant head referee work well <laughs> together. And then the head referee's job is, is liaising them with the assistant head referee and know it's going to plan. But it, it does happen. Um, uh, it, it's the timeouts and the, um, the uh, penalties and all that, which you don't account for and is the unexpected really, because you don't have that in your schedule because you don't know how the matches are gonna be. Yeah, a couple of things. And I'll jump to you, Sandra. I see you've got, see you got your hand up. Uh, we are doing uh, a call room um, masterclass uh, that, that's coming up. Um, so sign up for that. And I think we've got a couple on there. One is around refereeing the call room, I think. And the other one, I think, is around the management of the call room. So if you want to kind of go in depth on that, and it's not me leading those, so you'll have someone far more interesting and uh, better to look at, I would assume. Uh, so uh, do you sign up for those? I think they'll be, I think they'll be really useful. On the case of Medical and technical timeouts, again, if you're not sure what they are, they're, they're up to 10 minute blocks that can happen at any time. And uh, tie breaks as well. We don't schedule these. You don't have them in the schedule because they don't happen every round. And so when that does happen, that is time, which is not your fault as the head referee, but yet you still have to catch up on. Um, so there are things that you do need to factor in. And you do have... Uh, I guess, soft rounds, uh, which is probably where you know you have some quicker players. So, uh, so BC4s, for example, or uh, BC8, so learning disability players, which you know are going to be fast. So you have these courts, which you know you may be able to catch some time. You may have the luxury of a spare court, which might be a practice court until you need it, and then you commandeer it in order to try and catch up on time. So you do have these little techniques that you can do but not everywhere. And certainly, again, not at local, necessarily at local or regional level competitions, at those entry level competitions, it is really hard. Sandra. Yeah, thanks. Um, firstly, yeah, I'm running uh, coaching the core room next week, which is actually about what coaches need to know, what to prepare their athletes for. And then the officiating the core room one is thing is coming up after that, which Natalie's just added. Yeah. Um, what I really wanted to say was that um, I don't think we've got Jan or Lauren on tonight, who are our most recent international referees, but their um, experience at the Europeans, I think it was last year, uh, year before last now, um, was that, that they realised that the standard of what we're delivering in this country in terms of our officiating is now the same standard pretty much as those people who are officiating at major um, European world championships, etc., and what you've just raised there with the keeping to time, et cetera, at those big events, you would have a technical delegate, competition manager, and a field of play manager that would be managing those things alongside the head ref, assistant head ref, and call room manager. And actually, whilst we've improved our delivery and our service to our athletes, we haven't necessarily got the, the luxury of having all those positions. So it does fall more on the head referee, but I would suggest it falls quite a lot on the competition manager as well. That's a, a really good relationship to develop so that you can be discussing between you how you're gonna manage that. Because it affects, if you've got somebody that's announcing who's coming out into court as well, that's another thing that comes into the mix. So it's a lot for head referee to, to take on. And I think if those things are becoming too much, I think you need to be talking to your competition manager at the same time. And um, obviously we're very lucky with Rachel, we've got someone who, with vast experience who can, who's also got experience internationally actually. Um, so, you know, make use of that. But equally, if, if this is my own personal suggestion now, but if actually head refereeing is getting that complicated and that difficult, I think you need to be asking, you know, how that liaison is going to be managed before you get into the really big competitions where it's likely to, to have more of an impact. Yeah, thank you, Sandra. Yeah, I think one of the, the big points that you said um, around the standards of, of competition is absolutely something that I think many people will be able to testify on, on, on this call. 
um, whether that's friendly internationals all the way through to uh, to business competitions. I remember the very first competition I was head referee at. Um, I think Steve, you were at that. It was in Poznan, yeah. and it it was not good. <laughs> it really, really was not good at all. I'm being and I'm being very diplomatic, very diplomatic in this, um, and you know, I was just I was I was crying out to be in Wakefield or Bedford or somewhere, you know, Kettering, somewhere like that, which, you know, is nowhere near as as nice as a a beautiful Polish town of Poznan. And it really is a lovely town. But hey, I was, I, I would have, I would have paid good money to have Natalie and Rachel and the whole team out there to really get, get through that because, um, yeah you do realize that the standards and again yeah I, I don't want that to be daunting for people who are on on the call who are maybe level one referees or are just thinking about head refereeing um and that's where the support bit comes in that was one of the things i absolutely did not have in any way shape or form was any support going into that into that competition i didn't know what to expect i didn't know what was different or not and that was one of the things that really prompted me to I, I gave feedback to to uh, at the end of the competition which of course you do but also to Watcher England and saying look we have to do something more for our domestic uh, training because I've experienced firsthand of not knowing your know, landing and not knowing what was expected of me or what was going to happen in the competition and it certainly wasn't run in the same way as uh, as it was over in England and Scotland and, and Wales. I mean, as a good example, I was um, in Poland as a coach, you know, with the, um, and um, we got into a situation on court where uh, the Czech international team had um, complained that we'd swapped a BC1 player for a BC2 player when, in fact, we were allowed to do that anyway. We were within all the rules and I knew we were. So I simply asked for the head referee and they came over and they weren't able to... um, to resolve it. So I asked whether they would mind going to collect their copy of the rules and I would show them in the rules, you know, where the relevant parts were. And the head referee came back and said he didn't have any rules. So I think- When you say he, please just clarify this was not me. Just what, just- No, 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 no. For the sake of my own ego. This was a Czech head referee (laughs) at an international competition that the England Performance Group were at where I was a coach. So this is a friendly, a friendly international, just friendly uh, international. But there yeah. were about five different nations there, and the head referee yeah. didn't have a copy of the rules. Fortunately, mm-hmm. I had one with me in my bag at the end of court. But yeah. and and I think I think that's something we should be really, really proud of in this country is our standards and you know what we're doing as officials, and therefore what we're providing for our players is fantastic. So. Yeah, don't be daunted by that. Be really proud of being part of that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we've got a, a couple more. Uh, we've got to hear from Rachel next, then Dan. Uh, then I'll, I'll kind of wrap it up and share a few experiences of mine. Then it'll be open for, for questions for, from people. So do you have questions in your mind on, uh, as to what you want to ask? Or if there's a question you've ever wanted to know, why does a head referee do that? Or something, then please feel free to, uh, to ask in, in about 10 minutes or so when we wrap up. So let's hear from uh, Rachel Miller. Hi, I'm Rachel and I've been a head referee now for about four years, I think. Um, I started becoming a head referee purely because I was the most experienced referee that was at a competition. Um, So I was the one who was able to answer some of those what if questions. Um, Nationally, I've been part of the head referee programme for about two years. Um, and being a head referee at Heathcote Cup Finals and then some of the BE Cup rounds. Uh, My best bit of advice that I would give anyone who wants to consider becoming a head referee is to not panic and think you need to know all the rules. I really don't, um, but what I do know is, is where to look for them. So I have that guide there and that rule book and if an official gets stuck, I can help them work through the rules and, and come to an answer. Um, so what I would say is if you are thinking about it, it's really good fun. It's lovely to support other officials to make the right decision. Um, and it's great, another volunteer role to have with England. Lovely. Some great encouraging words to, to finish off with. Uh, I don't think Rachel's on, on the call, so 
uh, I'll run through run through these and um, and I'll try and think like Rachel does. So the great thing about uh, Rachel is she talks about there are starting locally. And like I say, we, we don't know exactly uh, how things are going to return, but I would expect we're, we're not necessarily going to start with the biggest competition we've ever hosted. It's much more likely that we're going to start with smaller competitions. And, and Rachel's just a great example of someone who uh, is involved a lot locally anyway, but actually was the most knowledgeable in the region that she was in. And we may have people on this call who, as a level one, you may be the most qualified referee in your county. Could be. And so therefore, actually, you are the right person in order to, to lead a competition. That might not necessarily be one of these performance competitions. It could be Heathcote Cup, which is around participation. It could be a schools-based competition. But actually starting locally and being the most experienced person, that could be you if you're, even if you're a level one uh, even if you're a level one referee and there you can develop and there you can kind of move up to national level as your skills progress and as the opportunities arise and and Rachel really shared very nicely there about how that how that developed to then being head referee within a couple of years of the Heathcote Cup finals interesting again she reiterates the point around uh, not panicking and also not needing to know everything but the one thing you do need to know is where your rule book is, uh, which is great because Sandra literally just mentioned it. It was almost like we planned it. Um, and I think that that is absolutely true to reiterate that one of the earlier points, we expect you to know most of the rules. We want you, you need to be knowledgeable. And to Steve's point, like you do need to know the rules, but you don't need to know it all, but you do need to know where it is and, and where you could find it really easily. Um, Having been an international referee for many years, I can't remember how long now, a long time, um, and then having been a head referee for the last six or so years, uh, I don't know all of the rules, uh, but I do know where they are in in the rule book to be able to jump to them really, really quickly. Um, and hopefully that's something that we can continue to, to work on is our, our knowledge, and that's something that we can work on whilst there's no competitions going on. So thank you, Rachel. And let's jump to the final one. Um, I don't think he's on the call, so I will say this is the longest and this is the one I had to edit, but it's great. There's some really good points that he, that he makes. So here we go with the last video for tonight. Hi, I hope you're well. So why did I become a head referee? Me, I saw head referee as a natural progression for me um, from being a referee. In the 2013-14 competition season, I was approached by uh, Botcher England to see if I would head referee at one of the upcoming regional competitions. At the time, I was a little bit nervous, a little bit apprehensive because I didn't fully understand what it would involve to be a head referee. Um, but I was offered some support and guidance from um, not only the Botcher England staff, but the other head referees in the country to to support me in taking on the role at that competition. Some of my top tips for you as head referees. Um, firstly, it's expect the unexpected. Um, as a head referee, you can come to a court and you may think that you're going on to, to a measure or, or to to deal with a, a rule inquiry um, but actually you could get something completely uh, different and random thrown at you as a as a query um, for example my first competition as a head referee I had a ramp assistant halfway through the game leave the court um, to go and find his false teeth that he took out at lunchtime um, so yeah anything can can come your way as head referee I guess second top tip is to be confident in your your knowledge of the rules and your ability to apply the rules in the uh, given situation and the right situation um, because often that's what you're called on to court for and um, that I'm measuring and if you're if you're not confident then the referee and or the player might doubt your decision. So um, having that confidence in your ability is is a key point. Um, 
And I guess finally, it's to relax because if you're relaxed, you will make um, more of a rational and um, clear decision. If you're tense and you're um, rushing around and trying to um, think about everything else that's going on, you may miss a vital piece of information when you're giving some um, clarity to a rule or um, you may make a wrong decision. So if you're relaxed, um, hopefully then everything will run smoothly for you. I look forward to seeing you back on a court soon. Um, take care. Thanks, Dan. Some really good points. Why he's beyond his years. Um, I, th I think uh, just on that last bit on the pressure element, if you if you didn't catch one of the previous one courses I did, but I, uh, I think it was the first one was essentially focused on pressure management. Um, and I assume as this one is being recorded, that one was recorded too. So uh, it might be something that we will be able to share with you on how to handle pressure because it can be really difficult. It's easy to say, relax, but it's an awful lot. It's an awful lot harder. We can't just wear the t-shirt as, uh, as Frankie did. Um, you know, we've got to be able to, to actually put that into practice. Relaxing or to relax, uh, to be calm is a verb. It's an, it's an action, it's a doing word. And sometimes you, you really have to work on it and act on it in order to be it. So again, another great example of a natural progression, starting locally and working all the way through um, as a referee and as, a, as an international referee as well, uh, then into head refereeing. Expect the unexpected, it was mentioned earlier, um, the example that you gave was false teeth, but the, there could be all sorts of, all sorts of reasons um, that you could be called on for. And you know, one of the issues might be is if uh, there's a translation issue, thinking internationally, but it could be also that there's a communication problem that the player may be nonverbal. And so actually you have to suddenly bring in someone else from outside the court. How do you manage that? How do you make sure that the person coming in isn't coaching them, but you getting the right information there's all sorts of different things which aren't in the rule book per se it's all about what you need to do to get to the you know the right decision so you can have confidence and what I, in the decisions that you make and the thing that i really liked about dan's answer was it wasn't just about having the decision you know having confidence in decisions it wasn't just about knowing the rules it was have confidence in the application of the rules and I think that's a really key word is application because rules are theory. They are black and white. But the situations that you face on court are not theory and they're not black and white. And there will be situations where you have to navigate the rules in order to apply them correctly. Um, and that really is something that comes with confidence. It applies at all levels. So that includes, you know, your entry level head referees all the way through to international. You have to think about how you're going to apply the rules uh, in order to get the decision. Because like I say, the rules are black and white. The reality uh, is, is quite different um, when you sometimes when you meet people on, on call. So it's been great to hear from some of the, uh, the, the head referees. So hopefully start to give you a little bit of an insight as an introduction. Remember, this was really an introduction to head refereeing. Some of the things that you we think about some of the things that we find important. And just wanted to, to wrap up with some of the things that, um, that I maybe didn't come up and uh, that I wanted to raise before we kind of go to, to questions for, for anyone. First of all, we need you. We need you as a referee to support us refer head referees. We also need you and need people to, to become head referees. We don't want to tie people's hands behind their back. We don't want to be, you know, um, however uh, smiley and lovely they are, we don't want to be asking people into something that they don't know what they're actually going to be doing like Steve had. We want to be able to say, we're looking for head referees and you go, you know what? I, I want to do that. I, I want to learn more. So we need you really do consider uh, this uh, this evening and, and the interest in it. And if you can get the chance uh, to be an assistant head referee, which again is at larger competitions, then then please do do that because it's a great role to, to be in. You learn so much. Your days are so busy. Um, and so it's just a great role. I think the third element is something we joke about internationally with my friends is the loneliness of a head referee. 
there's many times that I've uh, that we've that sent pictures back and forth of me as head referee and, and an empty desk and the courts are full and everyone is busy and and you just sat there. You've got a ton of work to do. You've got to get through all of this stuff. But actually, it's, it can be quite isolating and quite lonely. You are the first one in breakfast and you are often having breakfast by yourself. You are the last one to leave. You are the one that then, if it's a bigger competition, potentially having to do work back in the evening to get schedules ready or change. Again, I'm not saying this to put you off. I really am not, and I don't want to daunt you. But it can be isolating. So again, that bit as a referee, if you can just check in with the head referee and just say, well, how are you doing? Not in a Joey Triviani kind of, how are you doing kind of way. Just checking in on them, just making sure that they that they're all right, that you could maybe get them an Earl Grey with extra milk, just for reference. Uh, that really does make a big, big difference. The bit we haven't really talked about is, is feedback, that bit, and it can be really hard and important, especially when you're doing, you know, a star and a wish, and that wish might be a big thing, and especially at entry-level competitions where there may be beginner referees. So, uh, you know, we're not going to talk about that too much here. Know that if you do come on the head referee training, which we would love you to do in the future when that's available, we do cover that in a lot more detail because it can be hard. You know, if a referee does make a mistake and maybe are consistently making a mistake, how do you pull them up and correct them, but encourage them because you need them to go out and referee the very next, you know, 15 minutes time. So you need to correct something, but you also need them to referee. And that is a really difficult, difficult thing. And that kind of leads on to the final point. All of this stuff I've said is hard work. Not gonna, we're not going to lie. We're not hiding that clearly by presentation, but rewarding, yes, absolutely. As I say, all of the people that are on, on this call got asked or put their hands up and are still doing it. And I assume and I hope that once we return after COVID, will have their hands up once again to become a head referee. Because you know what? I would much rather be on the court and refereeing. I really would. But actually, a head referee is, is an essential piece of the, of the cog, uh, oh, essential cog in the wheel, I should say, um, in order to, to make the competition go. So this is what you might think about or you might feel like after this. A bit of an ugly duckling. You might be thinking, oh, crikey, I signed up for this. I thought it was going to be brilliant. I was going to get all of these insights, these juicy stories about these dodgy players and all of these things. That's not really what I got. I got, I got a lot more than that. But this is what, it, what you might feel like. You might feel out of your depth. I'm only a level one. I might feel like a bit of an ugly duckling. But you know what? We all do. <laughs> we all have done. That is where we all started. And just know if you're starting now, the path to you becoming, you know, the swan, the beautiful white swan swimming uh, almost effortlessly across is easier than ever before. The training is there that hasn't been there. The, the tools are there which haven't been there. And so all I would take away, if, if you have in any doubts, is some of the words that I think uh, pretty much everyone touched on, you know, that encouraging element to encourage you to do it, encourage you to really think about this role and how you could, uh, you know, change up uh, how your relationship with, with refereeing and with the, with the botcher community. And when we do get to that point of saying, hey, we're looking for more head referees, you know, you want to put your hand up because you know what? You now realise that that person sat behind the desk that looks like they're doing nothing is actually probably the best head referee in the country. They are the ones that are, are the swans because they are busy paddling away and that you could be that person in a few years' time. So hopefully... This has been an encouraging evening and we are bang on time. And so uh, I would uh, thank you for coming. It's been lovely to, to do all of these. Uh, open it up now for, for questions. So that is the formal presentation done. So if you do have to jump off, it is half past eight. Um, but otherwise, I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions. And I'm sure maybe some of the other contributors do. A massive thank you to those who sent in, in the videos and the contributions. I know when we asked you, you didn't maybe quite know how we were going to use them. In fairness, I didn't know how we were going to use them until I saw them. Um, so, you know, a really big thank you to all of those that contributed. And if there's any questions, now is a great time.
There's a couple just come in the chat, Richard. So Gillian's um, asked, or she's from Scotland, and she's asking about more experience. There's, there's often only obviously one nationals um, in Scotland. I suppose the answer from me in, in that would be come and help us in England or any of the other home countries. We're, we're yeah, very keen to share things like this training and development. So that that spreads wider to actually on the ground and the competitions as well. Um, and I think also be mindful that as we return to, to competition and sport after the current situation, you might find that on the ground competitions look a little bit different anyway. So what you're used to as a regional might grow in size before you get to your old national style anyway. So there might also be that, I suppose, natural training element that comes out of a, a slightly amended competition structure as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we all, always welcome referees from over the borders and we also like to go over the borders ourselves to go to other competitions and help. You know, I've been down to Welsh Nationals, not for a few years, but I came consistently and uh, referee Thomas there can see on, on the screen, you know, many times over over the years and help them kind of set up their refereeing thing. So, yes, uh, we have, uh, this is a, a, I'm from Butcher England and representing Butcher England, but this is a, a UK thing and um, you are more than welcome south of the border as long as we are welcome north of the border because we do like to come and travel a little bit when we can. <laughs> One from Thomas in there as well. Um, what do you say are the top five personality traits you need to be a head referee? Well, oh, I, I don't know if there's five. Um, I, th I, think, I think being able to... Uh, see the future is always useful uh, but in the sense of if you can work backwards if you can go okay so we've got um the fit we need to finish and be out of here by four o'clock and you can work back whether that's a two-day competition a one-day competition a half-day competition if you can always keep sight of that end goal then I think that that's really useful. If, you, if you're someone who gets swamped in detail and can get lost in detail um, in things, then, then that's something that maybe is something you'd need to work on. So I think someone that can, that can dive into something specific and help in a specific situation, but also then be able to retract uh, and kind of take that um, bird's eye view of a competition. I think that trait of being able to go into a specific situation whilst keeping an eye on that end goal with that overall picture of the competition and what needs to happen uh, is probably probably one of the bigger bigger traits. And then there's all of the usual things. Communication um, is, is key. Empathy. All of the great things that, to be honest, just make you a really good referee, uh, to be honest, um, in, in many ways. Good question. Uh, can I add to that, Richard? I think you just need to be a very good manager and and don't be afraid to delegate. You know, <laughs> if you've got an assistant head referee, use them. You know, oh, we've got plenty del of other delegation is how I've uh, lived my career. <laughs> 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 yeah, use the people around you. And, and, and that, uh, uh, there's two ways to think about using them, but also asking for help in that sense. And I think Sandra touched on that a little bit with, with competition manager when things get a bit tough, like ultimately you know that support is there and feel free to feel free to, to use it yeah all right silence i think that potentially means the end of things if you um if you were uh if you still got a question but you didn't want to ask in front of the group then again i'll stick around for the next few minutes um otherwise i think there's a survey monkey for some feedback i saw so please do take the time to feed back to us. It'd be, be really useful. Uh, but have a great night. It's been lovely to see you.